violent geysers and rainbow prism pools, valleys and plains of waterfalls and fumaroles, a veritable sacred grove for wildlife and natural wonders, Yellowstone National Park is one of the planet's most brilliant jewels. But what geological forces have permitted this incredible landscape to form? Behind me is the amazing and beautiful lake at Yellowstone National Park. With all of its enchanting serenity, who would think that the world's second largest supervolcano is hiding beneath it, ready to explode in any moment, or any century, or any millennium? Let's take a look at the anatomy of a supervolcano and discover how this force of incredible destruction has created some of the most exquisite natural beauty in the whole world, and find out when it will all again be wiped from the face of the earth. I'm Luke, and this is Polymathy. The Yellowstone supervolcano is also called the Yellowstone caldera, from the Spanish for cooking pot, caldera. And this is a vast hollow that forms shortly after a magma chamber empties in a volcanic eruption. The Yellowstone caldera has blasted thousands of cubic kilometers of volcanic ash, called tephra, from the ancient Greek word for ashes, tephra, covering much of North America on more than one occasion. The source of this awesome force is the Yellowstone hotspot. Now, one of the most famous sites of hotspot volcanism is Hawaii. You see, most volcanoes are found at the boundaries of tectonic plates, but Hawaii's volcanic island chain occurs thousands of kilometers from the famous Pacific Ring of Fire. The underlying mantle is anomalously hot compared to the surrounding mantle, and this temperature difference leads to the eruptions of active volcanoes such as those on the Big Island of Hawaii. The simple model of this hotspot is that there's a point of hotter mantle over which the Pacific plate is moving, creating volcanoes that form one island, then another, then another, in a chain that actually shows us the relative movement of the tectonic plate over the hotspot. Exactly what causes hotspots in the world is a matter of scientific inquiry to this day and a good topic for a future video. Yellowstone is another such geologic hotspot, with demonstrated eruptive force much greater than the volcanoes of the Hawaiian chain. Over the past 20 million years or so, the Yellowstone hotspot has blasted holes in the Rocky Mountains, and extensive flood basalts from it have flattened the eastern Snake River Plain in Idaho, which we'll see up close when we travel to the Craters of the Moon National Monument in a future video. So what kind of eruptions are we talking about? Well, sometimes the eruptions are effusive, resulting in low viscosity lava flows of a less violent nature, comparable to Hawaiian volcanism, while the really big ones are pyroclastic flows, where high viscosity molten rock causes a truly apocalyptic explosion. Here's a map showing ash deposits from the most recent Yellowstone caldera eruptions, carried by the prevailing winds as far south as Mexico and as far east as the Mississippi River. For comparison, we can see how the modern era Mount St. Helens eruption from 1980 cast ash over a relatively small area. Eruptive material from Yellowstone has been identified in Montana as seven meter thick tephra deposits and as far away as sediments in the Gulf of Mexico basin. While some of the bigger events have occurred over the past several million years, the most recent super eruption was about 640,000 years ago and resulted in the ejection of some 100,000 cubic kilometers of tephra that temporarily devastated the North American ecosystem. No doubt any such eruption today would destroy most of the natural habitats and human agriculture in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and result in untold numbers of lives lost in both people and wild animals, suddenly changing global climate patterns that would further affect food production on all the other continents, resulting in unthinkable damage to the interconnected economy of the entire planet, which raises the critical question, when will it erupt again? So the last eruption was about 3,300 years ago, perhaps contemporary with the legendary Trojan War. But this was an effusive eruption, not one of the big super eruptions. Previously, geologists had estimated that the really big eruptions, capable of devastating the continent, that they occur every 500,000 years or so. Well, if that's the case, given that the last super eruption was 600,000 years ago, about 640,000 years, Aren't we due for another big one? More recent studies have determined that the period between these large eruptions appears to be increasing, and that we may be able to expect a wait time of more like one and a half million years. 
Whew, which is good. We have nearly a million years to figure out how to deal with a Yellowstone super eruption. But, of course, that's by no means a certainty. The extraordinary complexity of Earth's systems makes them notoriously hard to predict. But at least for now, we can rank the probability as uh, more comfortably low. So the Yellowstone hotspot, generating enormous amounts of geothermal energy, is responsible for many of the peculiar wonders at Yellowstone. Like its hot springs and geysers, Yellowstone has 55% of the world's geysers. Isn't that amazing? The plumbing here is actually pretty complex, but uh, here's a simplified model. The hot spot is, well, it's hotter mantle, right? So it's rising, and it, well, it can only go so high due to some uh, density questions that we'll talk about in a future video. But its heat gets transferred upwards, and that causes some of the lower crust to melt. Now, the lower crust, that's basaltic in composition. It starts to melt, but since it's basalt, fundamentally, even when molten, even though it's less dense due to the heat that it's containing, it can only rise so far. It can only rise to a certain point in the crust, at which point the crust, if it has lower density than this rising basalt, well, the rising basalt can't rise any further. But then what does it do? It heats the crust that's above it, eventually causing the much less dense rock above, in this case, rhyolitic composition rock in the upper crust, it causes that to melt. And that's how the upper magma chamber at Yellowstone formed. And this upper rhyolitic magma body, it goes from about 5 kilometers beneath the surface to about 17 kilometers deep. And it's about 90 kilometers long and 40 kilometers wide, underlying much of the park in its current form. If you're wondering, by the way, how we can be so precise with our knowledge of those dimensions, it's because of earthquakes. Seismic activity basically creates sound waves that travel through the Earth, and the way that they reflect and bounce around and then arrive at our detectors allows us to generate very clear images of the shape of these things underneath the surface. So th this is the perfect recipe for the geothermal activity at Yellowstone, where you need a source of heat, that's the first thing, available water, we got that, and an area rich in fractures, definitely have that. Surface water then percolates through the cracks in the rock, and eventually it gets superheated, by sometimes by solid rock above the magma chamber that's heated by it, or in some cases it makes direct contact with subsurface molten rock, because that, that molten rock can also percolate up into these cracks and create fissures and all, all kinds of interesting things. We talked about some of that in the Devil's Tower video. Go see that one. So this interaction can bring all kinds of unusual minerals and compounds and smells. It's like getting a bath and the steam from boiling eggs up to the surface along with the boiling water. And in the next video, we'll learn a little bit more about the spectacular effects this superheated water has on the landscape. If you have any questions about Yellowstone or geology, let me know in the comments, and I'd love to answer them and hopefully cover them in future videos. Thanks so much for watching, sharing, and subscribing, and thanks most of all to my Patreon supporters. Wale